Hey, what's your problem? You have business problems? We have business solutions. Not guaranteed. Well, maybe. Life is a fight. It is. In business, every day is a fight. <laughs> so, hey, what's your problem? Yes, thank you as always. John David Wells from the Wells Report. Check him out on Facebook. Got to give old J.D. a shout out every time we do this. Just a good guy. This is the What's Your Problem podcast where we talk to Middle Tennessee business owners and professionals about the one thing that keeps them up at night. It's always something when you got to run your own business. That kind of gnaws in the back of your mind, but you know, it's what we signed up for, right? This is a video and audio podcast. Check us out at whatsyourproblempodcast.com where you can like, subscribe, share, rate, review, complain, give suggestions, tell us who we need to get on. And also, uh, I forgot to say this in the last episode, but this is the year. Our big, hairy, audacious goal is 10,000 average downloads per episode. If you can help us get there, share it out. Let people know about it. If we're of service and value and you love to thrive in the Middle Tennessee business community, you know, I think it's a good podcast, but I'm biased. I am your host, Jim McCarthy with JimMcCarthyVoiceOvers.com. And today, another b and Mrs. Jamie Lee. Hello. Hey, how are you? I'm good. Yeah. And you got in your business. Thanks for having me on the show. Business owner at a body in repair. Yes. Nutrition, fitness, all that fun stuff, right? Yep, yep. All the stuff that uh, I'm kind of averse to. <laughs> I guess most people are, but we'll get into that. Yes. Uh, you, and If you're an avid listener of the program, did I just call this thing a program? What am I, 70? Hey, listen <laughs> to the program. Um, we do something called the Dad Joke Challenge. We're both familiar with Mr. Ed Fox. And we just kind of get things kicked off that way and uh, get the fun energy flowing. So here's the music bit and the bad transition. The Dad Joke Challenge is brought to you by Mr. Ed Fox and Trade Bank of Nashville. If you have a business or are in a business that has eh, maybe some items that are sitting a little long on the shelves, maybe they're growing some mold, you got some services that, you know, things are a little slow, try Trade Bank. Trade your services for some of the expenses that you have in business or even personally. Maybe you want to take your family on a a vacation down to uh, Alabama or something like that. You can trade with other trade bank members and uh, it basically costs you maybe 20 cents on the dollar. Something like that. I could have that wrong. Crazy. I'm going out on a limb by saying that I may have that wrong. Ed will be here next week. He will correct me for sure. Ed also has, uh, I want to say, three books on Amazon, grown tastic dad jokes. He is he he is has them at the ready, right? <laughs> he does. He Every really does. Wednesday. Every single Wednesday. So here we go. We're joke number one. The challenge is not really a challenge, okay? If you laugh, sure you lose a point. If I laugh, I lose a point. But we're not really keeping score. If you wanna groan or make comments, by all means do so. <laughs> all right. Joke number one, here we go. Actually, hold on. I switched windows. Why did the cross-eyed teacher lose her job? Because she couldn't control her pupils. <sighs> That's so bad. That is pretty bad. But I love a good cross-eyed teacher. <laughs> <laughs> I have to admit. Are you a cross-eyed cyst? <laughs> I guess. Number two. A man went to a zoo. All it was was a small zoo. They had one exhibit, a dog. It was a shit zoo. <laughs> that was pretty good. I Wasn't like it. there a shit zoo joke this morning that BNI makes somebody use? <laughs> Some, yes, I think it was Tom Law. He yeah. said something about shit zoos, and he said, sorry for the, sorry. The, language. the language. And of course, I was late. I, I should have hit the beep. I would have made people laugh. This is joke number three. Here we go. Why can't you explain puns to kleptomaniacs? Because they always take things. Literally. I don't know what a kleptomaniac is. It's someone who steals. Like, they constantly have to steal things. They take things. They take things. Literally. I got you. Yeah. yeah. Now I get it. That's pretty funny. (laughs) And finally, the last one, I promise. Why did the hipster drown? Because his parents threw him in the mainstream. (laughs) Oh. (laughs) That one's not bad. That one's pretty good. Got to reuse that one. Recycle it. Well, there you go. The Dad Joke Challenge. Just a fun feature to get things going, get the fun energy going, and be creative and all that fun stuff. Brought to you by Trade Bank of Nashville with Mr. Ed Fox. All the details are in the description. Please check them out. 
worthwhile to look into for sure. And just in time, the music bed ended. Nice. So, Jamie, here we are. You, uh, you like, you, you're, you're almost like um, people look at me who live in Franklin and Nashville. In order to come and visit in Spring Hill, they feel like they're having, they got to drive into Alabama. Yeah. Right. Yeah. You're even more south than me. Yeah. You are 20 minutes <laughs> south of Columbia. Yeah. BFE. Yeah. B- oh That's my goodness. For sure. But you're not from around here originally, or are you? Originally, I'm from Illinois, Central Illinois. So far, I don't like to tell people that because I don't feel judged whenever I say that. But I mean, Central Illinois is is country. Yeah. Right? Yeah. You can watch your dog run away for two weeks. It's flat <laughs> right. country land. It's just. I've never heard it put that way. You can watch your dog run away for two weeks. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so when did you guys move down here? When uh, when did it all begin? Um, let's see. 2010 is when we moved here. And I moved for, the quote, the mu- music industry. Um, I was actually a professional photographer at the time. I had a band who was a friend and family member. They were just, they're real close. We considered them family. In no. fact, I didn't realize they were family until I was, you know, grown. <laughs> I was like, wait a minute, they're just friends. Right. Um, but they were uh, pursuing the mu- music industry, and they were looking for a photographer, and they wanted me to kind of be their like their everything photographer. So I was kind of a journalistic style, mm-hmm. and followed them everywhere. I photographed them on um, the Grand Ole Opry and at Ryman, and um, for their their photo shoots, like, I mean, there are video shoots and everything else. So I was kind of a second shooter for that type of a thing and just, you know, just followed them around journalistically and took pictures of their whole family. So basically during like technologically the DSLR revolution time. Uh, you could say that. Little yeah. prosumer camcorders yeah. or yep. yeah. what was your, uh, your, your camera of choice? Were you a Nikon um, person or a Canon? No, Canon. Yeah. 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 I yeah. Know, Good answer. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. yeah, for sure. People really do get hedged into those camps, man. It's like Ford they versus do. Chevy and yeah, Volvo versus Saab. Nikon, though, if you look at the photographers that are award winning, like some of those Nikon photographers, a lot of them are German and they're phenomenal, but they're like, they don't Photoshop or anything. They don't edit their photos. It's like they make that moment perfect mm-hmm. and they take that picture and it's like the winning shot. They don't even bother looking at mm-hmm. it. Yeah, mm-hmm. that's old school photography. You couldn't yep. do that back in the day. I know. You know, and it's one of those things that even when I got into radio production, had it not gone to a digital audio workstation type of mind, you know, model, I don't know if I'd be doing what I'm doing today because yeah. I learned how to cut and splice tape on a reel reel. Yeah. And that's how you did production back in the day. Yeah. I actually learned how to do photography in, in a dark room. Like I took. That's old school. Belt. It's old yeah. school. Yeah. Photo and mess. I actually rebelled a lot. Like when they decided to switch over to digital, I was furious really? because I'm like, that is, that's an art in your, like the digital world was just like robbing us of our art form. It's like a de- bastardization. Yes. Right. And I was so furious that I was like, I don't want to have anything to do with it. Because I found out like I'd gone into my local um, film shop and they were just, they were all the buzz about it. They're like, yeah, they're doing away with 35 millimeter. They're doing away with all film types. And I'm like, what? Wow. And they're like chemicals. They're going to stop producing all of this stuff. And, and th- like they were actually, that, that shop was talking about, you know, their career ending there, you know? And I was just like, I, I can't do it. This is, you know, yeah. I revolted against it. Um, but then I missed photography. Like I walked away from it and I missed photography and um, started having <clears throat> kids and thought, you know, really wanted to start taking pictures of them some more. And then, so I bit the bullet and got a digital camera and then just kind of fell in love with the new art form. Of so the you were like, world. Oh, okay. Yeah. I like this technology. Yeah, yeah, it's not so bad. Well, I could see the overlap, like in Photoshop. You know, have you ever seen the little? Have you ever played in Photoshop? Uh, re- yes, reluctantly. Okay, okay. Yeah. Well, there's like that little hand thing that you can burn, and you know, so in the dark room, you would actually use your hands to like manipulate the light, so that really? the exposure was different. You know, depending on how your your photograph was take it was taken if there was hot spots in the photo so like i could see all these connections i was like oh you mean i can click a button instead of hold my hand over here yeah <laughs> so it just was it, it was just a, it was a nice transition i guess but um that actually led me into photographing 
the um, cover for a book that actually ended up going Amazon bestseller for five years in a row, and then New York Times bestseller for two. Oh, wow. so, and it was a diet book. There you go. Yeah. Right on. It's funny with photography because and how similar it is with how video and audio production has come along. They've kind of been parallel mm -hmm. with uh, the technological advances. And it's funny because you see, you look at how things have progressed. Again, even with podcasting, if I didn't have this Rodecaster Pro, I've done podcasts in the past where you have to get a recorder of some type, you have to load up your mics, you have to get all your cables, you have to get um, you know a way so everybody can hear each other with headphones. So that mm -hmm. typically involved a headphone app of some sort. It was just a nightmare, you mm -hmm. know, just setting it up. And by the time you get everything situated, it looked like a rat's nest. Right. And then this thing came along, and I'm like, oh, okay. Now I can wrap my head around it, and this makes it so much easier. Mm -hmm. Like you see me use it at BNI. We have a roadcaster at BNI. Mm -hmm. I've got one that I take with me for uh, remote podcasts when I bring the studio to my clients. And I always, I'm like, I'm trying to get a deal with Road. I'm like, guys, I'm selling these things probably, I don't know, anywhere from three to five a month. Wow. You know, and just give me a deal. Give me a dealer type of situation, and I can make a little money on it. You yeah, know? no joke. But without it, I wouldn't be doing podcasting. Yeah. It's just way too much. Yeah. But I mean, with uh, with the old school aspect of photography, I would imagine that you could probably start a YouTube channel showing people how things used to do, mm. how it used to be, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. And how you developed film. Yeah. I would be interested <laughs> in watching that. I would yeah. imagine even like some of the newer generations wanting to go back. Like my daughter is really big into uh, listening to vinyl. Yeah. You know? Yeah, I mean, know. you never know. It would be amazing if it did come back. I think, like I said, I think it's an art form. It really is. It really is, because you had to know how to use your camera. Yeah. You know, and, and basically have faith that the picture came out okay. Mm -hmm. I know when I take pictures, I have to, you know, get dial into my, my settings as best as I possibly can, as far as what I know, because I've mm -hmm. never been formally trained, and then take the picture and look at it. That's uh, too bright. Mm, you know, yeah. and you have the histogram built in and all that stuff. Yeah. But I mainly shoot video with those cameras anyway. So yeah. I got to look at something. Right. So. Well, you can shoot in raw now too, and yeah. which means you can capture all of the colors that are available there and you can just go in there and manipulate them. But in the dark room, that's really, you know, what you were doing was you were really manipulating those, those contrasts, you know, in the, in the liquids in the fluid and then hanging them up to dry. And I mean, it was just, it's like you always see it in the movies, but you have no idea what they're doing. Right. You know, movies from the <laughs> 80s and 70s and stuff. You know, you go back to a classic movie like Jaws, mm -hmm. where they had to take pictures of the, the bite wounds in yep. some of the scenes. And back when I was a kid, I'm like, I don't know what the heck they're doing. What was, why are they putting the paper in water? Yeah. You know? Yeah. And then all of a sudden you see the image come to, and oh yeah. my gosh. I don't know. It is an art form. <laughs> it is. Yeah. yeah. It Definitely. is a, a, a just a. a Pers perseverance of perspiration. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, so do you still do photography? Um, on my iPhone. <laughs> <laughs> That's the other aspect from a I tried know. and true traditionalist photographer, the photographers. Yep. There are people actually going out and shooting on iPhones and charging people. Yeah, I don't doubt it. I used to, when I transitioned over, like some of my last clients, I got to the point where I was like, I'm it's, I'm just going to like see how they respond and set my phone up on a tripod and take a picture with my phone just to see if they were like, what the heck is she doing? But, you know, it's like there's less work in the iPhone. Right. Than, than, I just put a filter on it, you know. Right? You like know. I can just stick an Instagram and do some <laughs> different filters. Put, put the dog cartoon tongue hanging out of your right, mouth. Right, right. Yep. But I mean, it's looking at that and even there are guys that do side-by-side -side, uh, comparisons of shooting something um, video-wise with an iPhone mm -hmm. next to an actual like red camera. I'm mm -hmm. like, what really is the difference? And typically you can tell the difference when you zoom in. The right. iPhone gets a lot more pixelated and you got more, still get a lot more detail with the, the 4K red or 8K red that they have now. Right. Yeah. Have you ever done video work of that magnitude with... I had just started getting into the video side of it and it was kind of a long, long story, but... In that whole process of going from photography to not doing anything, mm -hmm. um, I had done, you know, the book cover, um, but then I had a personal tragedy. That was when my dad was diagnosed with a blood clot, mm. and so that kind of put me on the whole 
health and healing and nutritional road. So I kind of abandoned everything photography and just kind of learned as much as I could about health and healing. Purpose shift. Yeah. Yeah. I've had the same thing happen to me. It was a big purpose shift, yeah. I have a theory that when people get to a certain age, for me it was 37, but typically in that 40-year-old turn, Mm -hmm. I think a lot of people have a seasonal purpose shift. Yeah. And for me it was getting out of radio. Uh, I had a little bit of a tangent going into the collision business, but I got into the car business. It wasn't a permanent thing, but it was my... It was a educational experience that was a transition to what I'm doing now. Mm. And although I'm a lot of what I'm doing now is still in the production for video, audio, things of that nature, uh, like I did in radio, it's just as me as an entrepreneur. Yeah. So that shift was huge for me, mm-hmm. you know. So this similar, your inspiration came from your dad. Yeah. Yeah, it really did. So he was diagnosed with a blood clot that started in his pulmonary artery and it went down to both ankles Mm -hmm. and it was one continuous clot. And he was, they basically wanted to amputate one or both of his legs. Mm -hmm. And he was 56 at the time. He was a top private investigator for a company. He was flying all over the United States. He was licensed in almost every state. And he was, you know, in investigating insurance pr- fraud for these big companies. And he was almost an empty nester. I grew up with um, eight siblings. So there was nine of us growing up. And the last one was in the house. And when this happened, he was sent into the emergency room, went into surgery right away. They tried to bust the clot, couldn't couldn't get it to bust at all. Right. Um, and so they just basically said, pick your nursing home. You're going to have to have one or both of your legs amputated in the very near future. And they told me he had type two diabetes and basically, um, told him that the best thing he could do is staple his stomach. Really? Yeah, it was, it was devastating for him. Mm-hmm. And I remember my mom just fell to the floor when the surgeon called to tell her this. And she just fell to the floor and she was crying. Mm. And I had like this overwhelming, like, I don't, I don't know if you want to call it faith or just this, this voice of reason that said, no, this is, this is, um, this is man's prognosis. This is not God's prognosis. Mm -hmm. And I knew right then and there that food was going to heal him. And I didn't know much about food. I mean, I always joke that I could fill a post-it note full of (laughs) nutritional facts. Like I could really (laughs) fill that bad boy out, but that was about as much that I could fill out. Um, But at the same time, I knew instinctively that food was going to help him. Mm -hmm. So yeah, that started me on that journey. And I went to the nursing home um, about two to three times a day and brought him food every single day. I'd hired a nutritionist to teach me how Mm -hmm. to heal, you know, how to heal him with food. Um, At the time, I had six children. I have seven now. Um, But I had six children and I was homeschooling them and cooking. I got to say, you don't look old enough to have seven children. (laughs) My oldest is 23 today. Oh my gosh. Yeah. Yeah. You had to start young. I did. I, well, I was um, 20 when I had my first one. Okay. And um, yeah, I mean, I was young. We're all young when we have kids, right? (laughs) I was 30. (laughs) I'm an old man. (laughs) Yeah. 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 So um, yeah, in that process of just taking in food every day and, you know, I just really committed to like trying to heal him. I mean, he was my daddy, you know? So I had to do what I had to do. And about three months later, he walked out of there with both of his legs intact. Um, three months? Three months. What were you yeah. feeding him? Um, lots of good food. Just, I mean, we did everything from wild-caught halibut. I had never never knew what halibut was until that point. Hmm. Um, we did bison. We did all sorts of different foods. Um, you know, lots of vegetables. Um, and yeah, but three months, and he was completely... Uh, type 2 diabetes was reversed. Um, he lost 100 pounds and he was released three months early from the nursing home. So in the nursing home, was he keeping active? 
No. So uh-huh. he was sedentary. Yeah. Nothing much. but pure diet. Yeah. Oh my god. I mean, they did the little, you know, little exercises in the room and walk the hallway, but right. it wasn't until like the last month that he was really able to start walking. Nothing that you a typical 57-year-old man would need to because I mean, as we get older, our metabolism mm-hmm. slow. God knows I know that. Mm-hmm. And, you know, I got to do something in my life to because I feel like I'm ballooning up. Mm-hmm. Um, it happened oddly enough when they put me on a CPAP, my wife got tired of, you know, oh. hearing me, you know, survive at night or <laughs> strive to survive. And uh, she's like, we got to get, you know, you, you got to get you checked out for sleep apnea. It's keeping yeah. me awake. I'm worrying about you. And I uh, went to the, did the sleep study. Well, you need to see. Okay, fine. So I get it thinking like I've hear, heard from everybody how much better you sleep, how much yeah. deeper rest you get. And your body just responds so positively to it. Dude, I put on like 15 pounds. Hmm. And I'm going, what the crap? I don't anticipate this kind of a side effect. Yeah. And uh, the reason being, I, I surmised that it was because my body was no longer in panic mode. Yeah. That it could finally relax. Mm-hmm. And like, oh, yeah, we don't have to burn all those calories off at night. No, you're good. <laughs> That's what yeah. I think happened. So. I mean, could be. It's it's yeah. possible. Yeah, but it's uh, definitely a nutritional shift has got to come my way. But it's, and I know what to do. Mm-hmm. It's just convenience and time and yeah. management and all that fun stuff. Yeah. So he kind of, he walks out of the nursing home. Yeah. After three months, mm-hmm. somewhat sedentary, and just dietary change, all yeah. power foods. Yeah. Like Absolutely. blueberries, granolas, halibut, fish. Yeah. Yeah, you name it. Really. Yeah. And how long ago was this for you? Oh gosh, that would have been. Hmm, probably 2012, around in there. Okay. Yeah. So I moved here in 2010, and right. then it was a couple of years later after that. Yeah. So a total, total purposeful shift. Yeah. yeah. And then, <laughs> to make matters worse, I thought I was eating healthy. I thought that I was, you know, like now that I've taken my dad through this huge shift in, in his life that, you know, that I had a grasp on nutrition and grasp, grasp on, on health and everything. And then that's when my daughter was diagnosed with polyarticular arthritis. At oh my goodness. the age of 10. Wow. Yeah. And that was pretty devastating. And I, um, they basically told her that she was going to be crippled uh, in about eight months if I didn't go with the, the um, treatment plan that they had laid out for her, which in essence is chemotherapy. Right. It was injections in her hands once a week for the rest of her life, whether she needed it or not, like like around the clock medicine, um, pain medicine, everything, whether she, you know, showed that she needed it or not, it was to be continued forever. Um, they told us that even if she went into remission by miracle, that she would have to continue the injections and the pain medicine for an additional five years. Hmm. Yeah. Just to, you know, make sure that it was in remission. Um, oh, pharmaceutical so, companies need to make their yeah, money. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then I asked her, <laughs> this was the, the the big moment. I asked her, I said, well, what about food? Mm-hmm. I had just gone through that whole process with my dad, you know, so I'm thinking maybe there's a chance here. And she says, no, don't worry about even going gluten-free. There's no studies to prove that food causes inflammation in the body. And I was like, you got to be kidding me. Like, first of all, I'm so grateful she said that. You ever have one of those moments where you're like, you're so caught up in fear that you hear this one thing that just like shifts you to think that's maybe not right. There's something not right. And so I knew that food does cause inflammation in the body because of what I experienced with my dad. So I was glad that she said that, even though I I know she's wrong. There's lots of studies. I can pull up a whole catalog of them. Well, just Um, your own experience, too. Yeah, yeah, Yeah. absolutely. So, um, So, yeah, so that took me on to a different path of trying to go ahead and heal her with food through a different route. Um, I took her to another doctor and we found out that she actually had Lyme's disease that was triggering the autoimmune disease. Oh, wow. So it's kind of a double whammy. You know, Mm -hmm. now she's got Lyme's disease diagnosis and the polyarticular arthritis, which is very rapid growing. It just basically means that because it starts in the small joints, it'd be in all of her joints all over her body. And Lyme disease is treatable. 
Yes. Very much so. Mm-hmm. If you catch it early on, if you on, catch it early on, yeah. yep. You didn't see it. Was it from a tick? It had to have been. We live on a 13 acre farm. Right. You know, no bullseye marks or anything that you could detect. No, not that we could detect, but really? um, but you know, it had to be something along those lines. You know. Yeah. So, yeah, but basically, that put us on the whole journey of okay, well, we can heal this and we can heal it with food. So I did. I it, again, the 90 day mark. 90 days later, she was completely reversed of both the Lyme's and the autoimmune disease. Wow. Yeah. Just from food. Yep. What was she like? What was the diet prior to what was your dad eating? What was your daughter eating prior to everything? Well, so we had um, my dad had things like chickpeas and beans and things like that in his diet and um, probably a lot of things that caused that had lectins in it. Mm -hmm. Um, For my daughter, I focused more on making food bioavailable, which means like really um, focusing on foods that were cultured so that it builds her gut microbiome so Mm -hmm. that her gut can communicate to our cells what needs to heal. So that's where we started. So that's the, um, what do do you put in your gut? The um, probiotics. Probiotics, yes, yes. And it's one of the sponsors of the podcast from many, many years ago was a company called Kalioka Company. I love them. Right? You know of them. Yeah. Yeah, A buddy of mine is a partner in it, and uh, they have a cleaner that's Mm probiotic-based that their big claim was that they can get rid of... uh, Cat urine smell. Yeah. And I said, man, sometimes that even the dead body smell coming out of a garbage can. He's like, oh, not a problem. Really? <laughs> I think I I um, can smell the dead, I mean, the uh, cat urine more than the dead body smell. When you yeah. say that, those words are like, I can smell the cat, cat urine in my urine, head. It's just <laughs> it's like so permanent. Bad. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it, I've had. I bought a car one time. It was an 02 Ford Explorer that we got into it. And it was always like a hint of like... <laughs> And I had no idea what it was at the time. My wife gets in. She's like, oh, a cat pissed in here. I'm like, oh, that's what it is. She's like, eh, we got to try and work on that. (laughs) It never got out. Yeah. I was thinking it was four years I had that car. Yeah, that's horrible. So, yeah, that's a probiotic-based cleaner. Mm -hmm. For a while, my wife and I were, I, I tell people that she tried killing me one time by overdosing me on probiotics, and I got really sick. But it was probably because of something else. That yeah. I just caught something and everything was co- coincidental, but it, you know, well, I, mean, I like to accuse there her. There might of be some murder. truth to that. You, <laughs> you can get too many microbes in your gut, and they're actually sentient, and they they are like gut microbiome is so important that it will actually weaponize itself if it feels like it's at a threat. Like if it's threatened to be wiped out, it will weaponize itself and fight whatever it needs to fight so that it. it establishes its domain in your gut system i mean it's pretty essential to your body we're pretty diligent about trying to eat clean i mean i mean dare i say we're not as good (laughs) as we used to be but i mean we know what to do but at the Mm -hmm. same time it's like life how do we make this systematized yeah and easy quote unquote and at the ready you know, yeah. and that's that's the biggest problem with most people. Like I'm out on the road, I'm like I'm starving. I just got to go eat somewhere. Mm-hmm. Um, what out there today is like the big, in your opinion, the big like uh uh-uh. uh, just what uh, try and do best, but for sure stay away from this. Oh gosh, that's a tricky question. Um, I would say one. I, this is going to be horrible, but peanuts. I stay really? away from peanuts. And it's because they have a really high mold content. And so that mold content can trigger so much inside of you. And if you get mold literally growing inside of you, you've got problems. Really? Yeah. Peanuts. Peanuts, I know. You would think otherwise. Yeah, there is one peanut that is lower on the peanut or the of the mold content. I think it's like the Valencia peanut peanut. Right. But um but yeah, but most peanut butters out there, they're full of hydrogenated fats and stuff. So Well, they're not being made naturally though either. You buy right. typical peanut butters. We haven't bought peanut butter in probably ten years. Yeah. We make our own. Yeah. We put it in the food processor, just peanuts in a food processor. That's best. Let it run for five minutes and you're good. Yeah. And yep. it's warm. You yep. take it out and you pop it on a nice piece of bread and yep. my goodness. You snack. can do that with almonds and cashews as well. Is that better to do with the cashews or almonds? Yeah. No mm-hmm. peanuts. I mean, 
that's that's my don't <laughs> well you know that but you're you know that, that's yeah. what this is what you do and yeah. what do you typically find so how do you go about your business about with what you do well, I coach people virtually. So I help people all across the globe that are, you know, trying to reverse autoimmune diseases. So that looks like going through like a 90 day program of really helping them. Um, actually, I help them with their, their foods and I make sure that they're like gravitating towards high frequency foods. And that, the frequency of foods is pretty powerful. So it will shift your entire frequency up into higher frequencies so that your body can heal. I've heard about this theory, yeah. this, this phenomenon before. Are we typically low frequency and that's what gets in the, in the trouble? Yep. So yep. we got to resonate higher. Yep, we do. And we just got to find that. So high frequency foods, I've never heard of that. Yeah. Well, anything that is like, you know, came from the earth that those foods typically have a high frequency as it is. So yeah, those are really good foods, high frequency, but they will shift so many things in you. Um, it'll shift the way that you um, emotionally feel. Um, they will open you up to actually being able to deal with emotional traumas. Um, when we are in a low frequency state, we're actually attracted to and drawn to the low frequency foods, which just keeps us in those cycles. Right. And when people are starting to change their lives, they will like the, their intuition will tell them, I just, I need to clean up my diet. Mm -hmm. That's their first thought, you know, or one of their first thoughts. And that's their intuition telling them it's time to shift. It's time to shift out of these frequencies. Yeah. Do you know what the actual frequency is? You know, the threshold? I have a um, I have a list at home that gives off the frequencies of those foods, but I don't have them memorized. But I got yeah. you. Yeah. But there is something. Yes. Yeah. yeah. And you can actually see what foods resonate at different frequencies. Yeah. I actually teach people how to check to see if those frequencies resonate in your body by doing muscle testing. It's pretty cool. Really? Yeah. My yeah. gosh. I know. <laughs> so, I mean, so the rest of your family has got on to this uh, philosophy? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, my kids, you know, listen, we as parents, we do the best we can. <sighs> I, I'm going to tell you. We each, still fail. I know. Yeah. I will say partly my fault. Most of my kids were all born naked and illiterate. You know, I mean, that's just the way they were. They, right. And I try to teach them. <laughs> Um, they do eat really well when they're on my clock, but they will go to the dollar store every time they, every chance they get and yeah. get junk. <laughs> and that's the thing is that with kids, it's like they, they enjoy it while you can. Yeah. Cause you guys have, have the metabolism. You know, I tell my daughter, you know, we, we, we might be a little, all for all of us are on the heavy side and you know, and it's one of those things where it's like, look, all you got to do is walk a mile. Yeah. It will just come right off. I guarantee freaking tea it. And I said, you're going to realize this when it's, you know, not too late, but you're going to realize that you're 17 and all it takes is just a mile a day. Yeah. Go take 15 minutes and walk around the block. And enjoy that because right. it doesn't happen later in right. life. <laughs> I'm still trying to, it, but it, for you to have that effect, it takes you one mile. It takes me four. Yeah. Yep. Exactly. <laughs> that's an hour commitment yeah. for me. Yeah. But that's what I've been trying to do. I got to increase my physical activity as well as, you know, my wife's like, well, 85% of it's, you know, nutrition. And I'm like, I know this stuff. Yeah. I did body for life when I was 24, 25, 26 okay. years old. And uh, it worked for me, but mm -hmm. I was 24, 25, 26 years old. Mm -hmm. And I must, I dropped like 70 pounds, went from yeah. 240 to one. I got down to about 180 and I looked sick. Yeah. Like everyone like, are you okay? You look like you got, you got the hiv. Because <laughs> I was gray, you know? Yeah. So something was happening. I was eating way too much grilled chicken and m m m uh, protein shakes. Yeah, possibly. Yeah. What yeah. do they call it? Myoplex. That's what it was. Yeah. But I worked out, you know, six days a week and all high intensity, intensity uh, interval training and all that fun stuff. But How did you feel? I felt fabulous. Yeah. And I moved to uh, Vegas and that was the end of it. Really? Yeah. I tried to keep it up, but it was just, I got burned out. I was just done. And even today, when I go back to lifting weights and everything, I'm like, I just don't want to do this. Yeah. So I had the trick is to find the thing that you get to do that's fun that you're not, you know, it's not exercise. Mm -hmm. So it might be shooting hoops. It might be, uh, I've been really interested. I love watching, um, what do they call that? Um, gosh. Maybe I need to change my diet. I got old man brain big time today. Uh, MMA. 
Okay. Like watching the uh, um, the place in Vegas. Uh, what's the you know the the fighters? Um, I got Keegan over here to he's off camera. I'm looking at him and he's like shrugging his shoulders, going, "I don't know, dude. I'm not inside your head." But you know the the big one that does that does a, does all the MMA oh, fighting. Yeah, the big one. The yeah. big one. We'll yeah. just go with that for now. And they, uh, it's just so much fun to watch these fighters just. I mean, they are determined, and then you know they get all bloodied up, and they, yeah. you know the one guy goes down, and they start just pouncing on him, and at the end they're like shaking hands and hugging each other. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'd like to learn Krav Maga. I think. There you go. Ultimate Fighting. Thank you, UFC. Yes. <laughs> you ever you ever watch that stuff? No, my family is big into it. But really? Yeah, I'm not. I'm I'm not into it. I actually like barely watch television. <laughs> Really? <laughs> yeah. I'm more of a, I will sit on my deck and read a book by a fire. Like, uh, that's kind Physical of Physical my... books? You just actually read a book? Um, either way. I Usually during the day, I'll listen to audiobooks, And then I like to wind down with a physical book. What kind of books? Well, I call it romance novels, but my husband calls it medical journals. <laughs> <laughs> so they have the effect of romance novels on you, but they're pretty much medical. Yeah, based. I just read um, the last one that we read was um, Grow a New Body. Mm -hmm. And that one was phenomenal. It was about this doctor who basically got really sick in the Amazons. His brain was full of parasites wow! and his body was just full of um, bad viruses and microbes. And it was, he, he, he had so many parasites in his body that they put him immediately on the liver and um, what was it? The liver transplant plant list and the heart transplant list. That's how bad he had uh, parasites. Wow. It was intense. And um, he basically healed his entire body of, with food. And that's the thing, like even uh, I think in The Secret, yeah. where they talk about just willing things, manifesting things, yes. people that had uh, terminal diagnoses, yeah. you know, doctor walked out on them, told them, look, you got three weeks. Yeah. And they just, they just said, nope, I'm not going. And they just had, they turned, it's the mind over matter aspect of it. It is. And that's like even throughout COVID. Yeah. I was telling my family, I said, you got to just say, no, I'm not getting sick yep. and convince yourself. I said, because if you let the fear in, which is yep. what they were peddling that whole time, that's my honest opinion. Yep. All right. And they rushed a vaccine to the, to, to, to the surface. Mm -hmm. And I think now we're, we're starting to see the after effects of that. Mm -hmm. uh, and I was like, no, this is just too quick. If yeah. this thing is this dastardly and they're rushing a vaccine, how did they, who are they testing it on? Right. You got to ask these questions, but yeah, oh it is. I actually take my clients through a process when we, when we do coaching, one of the first things that I, I show them is I have them close their eyes and really feel into their body. And then I, I explain, like, have them imagine that I'm giving them a lemon and then they're cutting the lemon in half and then they're squeezing the lemon so that lemon just, or juice just, you know, surfaces up on the, on the top of the lemon. And then I tell them to imagine now slowly lick all of that lemon juice off the lemon. Mm -hmm. And immediately I say, do you feel that in your body? And they will feel it in their jaws. Like they just literally licked a lemon. And I'm, and I tell them that their body, because they were able to imagine that, envision that, their body responded. Mm -hmm. And that's what happens with our bodies. Our minds are so powerful. Yeah. It, they're Absolutely. so powerful. So if we believe that we can't heal, we can't. Right. It's envisioning a, a big part of what I went through when I was in my 20s doing Body for Life was my, my sole drive was to see a six pack. Mm. And every day I envisioned it. Yeah. And eventually I got there. You yeah. know, it's just one of those things that I just saw it. This is going to happen. Yeah. Come hell or high water. And that's what kept me motivating. And ever since then, I'm like, man, whatever switch, whatever dip switch in my brain switched back. I would love it if it just went back to that kind of commitment that I had. Mm -hmm. But I mean, it did take a lot of my time. Yeah. Meal prep and all that stuff and just getting it all together every day. Uh, I had a, my schedule allowed me for like a 10, 10 30 workout every morning because I didn't have to be at work till one or two in the afternoon, mm -hmm. maybe even three o'clock. And I worked, it was my first job in radio. So it was good. You yeah. know, I had that whole part of the first part of the day to myself. 
yeah. to make my lunch, to do all the meal prep. And even when I got back from the radio station at night, I would, you know, prep for the next day. Mm-hmm. It'd be, you know, egg white burritos or something like that with some mm-hmm. salsa and just, man, it was great. Yeah. I just need to figure out how to get back to that, the mindset. Yep. And everyone who does it, there's a guy I follow and I'm going to say, dude, Bradley, you know, I'm talking to you. <laughs> he, um, he, he's in his early 50s and just recently just started working out and everything. And he's a rich dude. I'm like, dude, you could freaking have somebody plan your meals for you and right. everything. It's like, oh, you just got to make the decision. Like, it's not that easy. Yeah. It really isn't. I'm still in my part of my life where I'm trying to catch up from the uh, financial ruin that radio almost brought upon me. Oof. You know? Yeah. It takes up a lot of your time. Yeah. You know? Yeah, that's true. Yeah, I went through that too. Um financial ruin almost whenever I had my 3,000 square foot square foot commercial kitchen but that was because of COVID oh really yeah so we actually had a like meal prep center for people to make those meals we had companies that would come in and make meals that were you know counted all your macros and everything like that for you and yeah that was uh that was a pretty big deal for me yeah, right. but COVID shut us down. 3,000 square foot kitchen. That is yeah, a monster. It was massive. Oh, was that down in Alabama too? <laughs> <laughs> it was actually in Columbia okay. in the Arts District. Yeah, and it, it basically was what I call like a gym membership for chefs. So chefs would come and use my kitchen. They would you know pay a membership fee and they would use our, my kitchen to manufacture foods or um, service their food trucks or um, do a pop-up restaurant or a ghost restaurant um, anything like that. We did big events for the community. I did a uh, pop-up farmer's market there mm-hmm. where it was called Farm to Fantastic. And so I had the farmer's market in the parking lot. And then in the kitchen, we had chefs at stations that were teaching you how to break down a chicken, how to, you know, um, uh, can blueberries, like all of these different things. So it had, you know, to maximize your your farmer's market. Wow. Yeah, it was pretty great. Did a lot of chefs use it to to do meal prep for uh, clients of theirs, things yes. like that. Were you doing that in there? So I had a 12-seater little commercial, I mean, uh, um, like a residential-looking teaching kitchen in the front. Mm-hmm. So I would basically teach people how to reverse their type 2, t- type two diabetes and make their own probiotics and you know make sourdough bread and different things like that. So I was more of the teaching end in the the pot because that, that's what I love to do is just teach people, you know. Um while the others were basically doing the meal preps and stuff. So yeah. We did for a while uh cuz we got really heavy into the biome stuff, uh not kombucha but the other drink that you would make and it had this kefir yes Mm -hmm. and we had the seeds and my wife got just masterful yeah to the point where she was showing people how to do it and i'm like you need to be charging them yeah she never did and she would (laughs) out of the goodness of her heart she just did it and we still could do it today i don't know why we stopped i think for some reason something switched and we ended up killing the seeds somehow yeah so we just kind of got out of the you know Devil's always on the details. Yep. Yeah. yeah. Whenever you want to do something good. Yeah. We'd have kombucha classes a lot too. Yeah. yeah. Kombucha is a tough one. Like kefir was always the palatable drink from what I remember. Kombucha is, man, that takes commitment. Really? That's what I've heard. I've never tried it. <sighs> like kombucha like it. is always like there's, something about it that's just tough. There's actually kombucha beers out there now. Really? Yeah. Well, that's up my alley. Yeah. They're is, expensive though. They got to come down. They're right. like $16, $17 for a four pack. Is six glasses of wine a night good? <laughs> no? Red wine. It's we'll red talk wine. later. It's in a box. No? I mean, <laughs> <laughs> depends on if your sanity needs it more than your body. <laughs> but there's supposed to be good antioxidants in yes. there. You know, I guess yeah. if you stick to one. Yeah. Right? Dark chocolate's supposed to be good, right? Yep. That's full of antioxidants and, and magnesium. Is that a high frequency food? Dark I would say yes, but it depends on what sugars it's made from. Oh, okay. Yeah. So if you have like, what is it, 93, 94% cacao or yeah. what, what they call yep. that mm-hmm. in the, in the chocolate. Yeah. It's not the, it's not the, you know, it's, it's not like, you know, Cadbury's. Right. Right. But it's, it's 
It is good for you. And if you're craving it, it means your body is needing magnesium. Really? And we are really deficient in magnesium because our soils have been depleted. Um, So it's a good source. Yeah. What do you call uh, when you walk on the earth with bare feet? um, Grounding. Grounding. Mm -hmm. You do that too? Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Does that make a big difference? It does. There's actually... um, you can see reports of the actual, like they do the body heat images. I don't remember what they're called, but you can see how the the difference in their their body image um, on a machine that will read how grounding actually reduced inflammation in their body. Do you have to be barefoot completely? Um, you yes. Well, you can't have anything that would kind of like electrical current that would stop the current. So if you had rubber bottom shoes or things like that, it's going to stop the current. Um, socks no, yeah socks you can do socks okay yeah because typically people we haven't walked barefoot as a species for so long that you know some of the you go into some of these remote areas of the world you see the yeah. feet of these people that do it all the time they're literally like you know soles of shoes yeah yeah they're they're so worn yeah. um we're nowhere near that as a culture right we still need our shoes but can you walk on like a concrete patio or does it have to be mm-hmm. grass or lawn or anything like yeah. that Yeah, it can be natural stone i believe um but no it can't be like concrete um it's it's more of just in the earth as close as the earth you can get the better okay yeah and so yeah. like in my backyard i've got a lawn that i could walk on it's you just can watching just out sit for the on a chair and put your feet on the ground. I oh, mean, you really? You don't have to walk. I mean, you can just I never you, thought you about just that. sit in the ground. I mean, yeah. anything like that. What about you're laying still on grounding. the ground. Yeah, I mean, yeah, absolutely. Really? Yeah. So it doesn't have to be with your feet. No. Uh-uh. Okay. Yeah. I may have to do that because it's for a while there. Even during COVID, it was just nice to get out in our backyard and just get some sunlight. Yeah. Which is what we try and do every day. Yeah, you know, and sunlight is the best form of vitamin D. It like, is. We are so deficient in vitamin D. Um, I think that's where a lot of our, you know, suppressed immune system and and issues, health issues, are coming from is is this massive vitamin D deficiency. And if you buy over the counter vitamin uh, vitamin D, it's made from most of them are made from lanolin, which is a pretty gross process. They actually go through and shear sheep and then take the wool and then they do an extraction of that dirty sheep wool and get the lanolin out of there and then they do another extraction process and get the d3 out of there so it's not very bioavailable but d3 from the sun is very yeah it's right you just walk outside yep but if you do it too much you still kill you (laughs) you know i think the sunscreen is doing a lot of that really yeah so you think the natural skin's response to tan or do whatever is supposed yeah. to happen. So there's lots of different ways. Like, okay, so if you wear sunglasses, you're not communicating to your body. You're 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 prohibiting your body to communicate that you need to um, basically block the sun, like protect your skin mm-hmm. because you're you're tricking your eyes. That's your sensors to be able to tell your body what it needs to do. So sunglasses are the culprit. Sunglasses, sunscreen. We're not getting vitamin D because we're lathering ourselves with these chemical sunscreens. And then that sun is penetrating that cream into our skin. I mean, it's... That's where the cancers are coming from? Really? Yeah, that's my opinion. Yeah. I mean, everybody has one. Right. They're like elbows. <laughs> yep. <laughs> <laughs> or some other part of the body yeah, that everyone exactly. has. <laughs> so you have, uh, that's amazing. I never thought about it that way. Yeah. I try to get sun every day. I mean, even yesterday we came, uh, we were done with our podcast shoot. We came back here. I had to drop some equipment off. Uh, I had to run back up the guitar center up in Brentwood. And uh, I called my wife and said, hey, I'm going to go, I got to go do this first. You want me to come pick you up? And she's like, sure, I'm going to take the tops off. And, you know, yeah. we drove with the, t- the tops off the Jeep. I love doing that. Yeah. 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 A lot of sunlight that way. Um, coconut oil is great, um, a great sunscreen. And so is just eating carrots before you go up. Like if you're going to the pool or the beach or something. Wow. Eat carrots. Really? Yeah. How many, <laughs> like baby carrots or full sticks? No, full sticks. Baby carrots are just full of sugar. <laughs> oh, really? Okay. Yeah. So make sure you peel the carrot first or do you want the outside? Or just wash it. It doesn't matter. Okay. Yeah. So total Bugs Bunny. Yeah. Hey, what's up, Doc? That's right. Yeah. Heading to Albuquerque. Yeah. In the hole. <laughs> you ever watch those cartoons when you were a kid? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Um, so let's get to this real quick. What's your problem? What, what issues are we dealing with, uh, Jamie? Well, 
I would say we kind of already touched on it. I was kind of upset we we touched on it. Already. All right, well, let's talk about it again. <laughs> um, I would say my problem in my business is BS. And Bravo, I'm, Sierra. <laughs> Bull Schneichel. Well, I'm gonna say belief systems. Oh, yeah, belief systems like Christianity, religious systems. Well, it can be that sometimes, but more of the belief of whether, like, the belief system that the medical field is there to help you, <laughs> like, right. entirely can save you. Um, yes, there is a place for that, but also they are they can keep you sick. Um, the belief system that you can't heal, the belief system that um, you're always going to be sick or you're always going to struggle, like, that's the problem that I see constantly. Um, kind of like you were talking about earlier, as far as like, you know, like putting your mind to something and, and focusing on that. It's your beliefs that really keep you where you are sick and not progressing in life. Totally. I completely agree with that. Yeah. Your beliefs will really dictate your life. Yeah. So yeah. as a coach, I like to call you on your BS. <laughs> <laughs> and it's not BS how you think it is. <laughs> what was uh, what's the most outlandish belief you've heard in that? Uh, oh concept? gosh. Hmm. Well, I would say the most outlandish belief I've heard in that. I guess it it is more that um, the belief that some things are not to your benefit when God created your body, like so. Let's talk about chakras for a minute. So chakras are energy centers on your body. And you can tell a lot if your body is out of alignment. Through Let me stop chakras. you. That You're a Christian believer, aren't I you? I am. And you're talking here about chakras. Yeah. That's, that's very, I know, that's a Far Eastern type of uh, yeah. belief. But I mean, hey. God created them. Right. And, I, yeah. and I'm, I'm not saying that they're not true. My wife uh, went to massage therapy school in Vegas when we lived there, and she learned all about that stuff. She's a huge believer in it. I mean, yeah. even blocking energies from people before yep. she touched them, and yep. she imagined handcuffs on her on her, on her her wrists. So before she would touch a person, uh, when she was done massaging, she would literally say a serenity prayer over them and then flick off their energy. Yep. Yeah. And that's how she protected herself. Yeah. She's a total believer in it. Yeah. Yeah. But people like will dismiss it or they won't even listen to it because they believe that it's not of God. It's not, you know, it's it's other religions and it's of the devil, you know? Right. And it's like, no, I mean, these this is a pretty cool body system that God created and like that's for our benefit, you know? Well, there's, a, I mean, even, you know, uh, Jesus, when he walked the earth, uh, we want to say he walked in sandals. Mm -hmm. But I guess they were made out of leather or something like that, mm -hmm. you know, some sort of skin, Yeah. which I guess would still, in a sense, it's not rubber. It would still ground him. Exactly. Uh, and he kind of led the way as to, um, you know, how showing us how to do a lot of things in life. Mm -hmm. I think the Bible even touched on, you know, nutritional aspects, oh, dealing yeah. with fish and grain. Not, and not to that, eat unclean meats and things of that nature. Yeah. Which I'm completely foreign to me. You know, I have no idea yeah. what's an unclean meat. Cow? Yeah. So, no, cow would be a clean meat. It's anything that's like um, bottom-dwelling fish or um, split hoof um, creatures like uh, pigs, pigs with sl split hooves. Um, so a lot of kosher stuff from yeah, the Jewish faith. That's right. that's all from from what was unclean. But there's a lot of science that now proves that all of that was unhealthy. And so I think that he was trying to keep his the race, the Jewish race, you know, um, healthy. Different. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Cause you have, uh, the bottom dweller fish would be crab, mm -hmm. lobster, mm -hmm. things that people pay premium dollar for these days. Mm -hmm. Is that still the case for us or have we technologically turned things around? We've done so much farm raised fish and stuff like that. Now, um, it's a big mess um, right. as far as what's healthy, but yeah, I still stick to that policy as far as bottom dwellers. So no Alaskan King crab for you. No, really? I mean, yeah. 
despite what those guys go through to, to catch it. Listen, if you are, <laughs> if you are, I know, a, like a deadliest catch, Dude, like, right? I could binge on some deadliest I, catch. Like, I got a story about that. Go ahead. <laughs> yeah. Um, but yeah, I'm just saying that, that, you know, when you heal your body, you can still eat foods. Like yeah. you, it's just when you are, if you're needing to heal and you're needing to repair, there is of course some guidelines to go through to get your body back into that state. But for me, it's like everything for me, my big Achilles heel is the chocolate milkshake. Oh yeah. Ice cream's a high frequency food, right? <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Really? <laughs> no. Damn it. <laughs> I knew that though. I, my husband makes me this um tahini ice cream. <sighs> so good. What's it made out of? Tahini. <laughs> Anything else? Coconut, <laughs> coconut cream and tahini, um, coconut sugar. Oh man, it's so good. We 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 did some things. Uh, we call it nice cream, and it's made out of banana. Okay, and it's actually really good. She'll make it sometimes, and kids love it. Yeah, yeah. But I mean that good. that and the kefir. We were really on a kick. We probably should get back into it. Yeah, maybe. Yeah, we had barbecue last night. So, oops. <laughs> But I mean, again, here we were, we had things to do and she was tired from doing stuff all day and didn't want to cook. Yeah. And we're getting ready for a camping trip. So we're trying to deplete the house of food before we leave, you know. I love camping. Yeah. Gosh, I take all my kids camping all the time. RVing? No, we tent camp. Yeah. Yeah. I did that once. (laughs) I grew up RVing and we we went tent camping in uh, 2016, no, 2015 in the fall we did three days, two nights, and I was like, oh, that's kind of cool. And then she wanted to do it again. She's like, oh, we're going for six nights. I'm going, excuse me? In a tent? That's committed. I just told her, I'm like, that's... in between, you know, microns worth of fiber between yeah, yeah. myself and a grizzly bear now. Yeah. So we ended up getting an RV that had yeah. tent ends, not a pop up, but a, uh, what they call a hybrid. Yeah. We tent camped all over Hawaii mm. last year. Oh, wow. It was fabulous. We just went from campsite to campsite and camped all over the island. It was fabulous. What's your husband's name? Joshua. And what does Joshua do? He's actually, um, he works for Allegheny Millwork. So they are, he's like one of, he's on the project management team. They put in all of the like uh, trim work for casinos and hotels. Wow. So like the Omni Hotel, they did all of that inside of there. So finish work kind of thing. Mm-hmm. Wow. Yep. yep. It's good work. Yeah. Especially big if projects. you can get a yeah, big projects like big, that. Big. We're talking multi million dollar project projects that they work on every day. It's crazy. And you're camping in Hawaii, you don't even get an RV. <laughs> no. Yeah. We love it. We yeah. do. Actually, we're going camping in October in Disney World because Disney World has the best camping. Frontier, ground. what is it called? The Great uh, What is great, it? Great uh, World or uh, something wilderness. wilderness. Yeah. Fort Wilderness. Fort Wilderness. I've heard about that. We yeah, never yeah, yeah. we've never been. Yeah. So last time we were in Disney is probably gonna be the last time we go for a long time. Oh. Yeah. It's like every I went to Disney at that point in time and I'm going, everybody complains about this place being too too expensive. Yeah. It's not expensive enough. All right, there's yeah. way too many pretty good people here. <laughs> right? Right. It should be more expensive, so there's less people. I yes. agree hundred percent. Yeah, you guys are way <laughs> overloaded. Yeah. You know, we we got there on a Monday and it was just maddening. Yeah. I think we spent, I mean, by the time 11 o'clock rolled down, we're like, just get us out of here. Yeah. And we went and grabbed lunch. Uh, we saw where, because we took our honeymoon in, in Disney when we got married. We took the kids by the uh, Grand Floridian where we stayed yeah. for our honeymoon. And just, you know, grabbed lunch, chilled out a little bit. I said, okay, now let's go back to the Magic Kingdom and just jam. We're going to grind and see all the things we want. Crowds were much better. And we just, you know, yeah. I think I did 30,000 steps that day. Yeah. Yeah. You, so the camping experience was good there at Fort Wilderness? Yeah, yeah. We'll yeah. have to check that out sometime. It's nice. They like, at four o'clock in the morning, they go around spraying for bugs. Like, really? Quietly. You're like, okay, that's why there's no bugs in the wilderness. Okay. Yeah. God knows what I'm ingesting. <laughs> well, that's yeah. true. And that's true. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so how do people find and follow you and all that fun stuff? Well, so I'm at abodyandrepair.com and I'm on Facebook with Abody and Repair. And I'm also launching a virtual health fair. And that would be a great place for people to follow along. Is everything you're doing like your thing, your own method? Yeah. 
Why don't you just call it the Jamie Lee method? <laughs> I'm serious. <laughs> well, I would, because I, what I would like to do is basically um, certify people in a body and repair in all of my protocols so that they can be body and repair coaches. And then, you know, then they can, then I can just either sell the company or whatever you know well that's that's the whole thing of uh well i want to work on my business versus in my business and it's there's a dichotomy there there are some people that are masterful at it but you're still in your business yeah you know even dave ramsey is tough to get out of his business right he's got his name on it yep um but if you look at things like that i mean it's uh you know building it and building the community are you familiar with fit and fat fat and fit fit and that's p and p it's called and uh, the person behind it, her name is, um, uh, gosh, Corinne, Corinne Crabtree. She's mm-hmm. out of Nolansville. Okay, I think and that she's sounds got, familiar. She lost 100 pounds one time, and she basically, without any, like, unadulterated opinions, yeah. very Gary Vaynerchuk methodology of about her, you know, swears like a sailor. Yeah. And, but has got a army and legion of women that, community you know our, our yeah. live life with her and she has a giant community and there has to be 140,000 women that follow and pay her monthly wow yeah yeah so it's incredible maybe that's something because that, she lost 100 pounds because but she's very she talks about her uh, journey and she does all these seminars and shows women how to do it and how to Amazing. how to adjust your relationship with food yeah is basically what she so does. she would be a great person for the health fair so the virtual health fair that i created is basically spotlighting different people across the globe who have different processes have testimonies that have gone through like i've got one healer that i just interviewed the other day that um she had ms completely like almost bedridden she was ordering her um, wheelchair when she decided to heal her body and she went from ordering the wheelchair to just taking over her life and completely healing and she no longer has ms so it's people like that who have incredible stories and who are um, have a process and develop processes like me Um, they're all coming together on this virtual health fair and i was actually going to tell you that because you had me on your show any of the listeners that want to attend the health fair um, as your guest, um, I'll give you a link so that they can jump on it and listen. It's twice a month, and it's all virtual, so you get to go on the show. And um, you know, it's it's like kind of like a Zoom, but it's it's in a different pl- um, platform. Um, but yeah, you can talk to these healers. You can you can like listen to what they have. I've got a mindset transformer who's going to be speaking at the next health fair. He's going to be pretty great. You know, I may be biased by saying this, but you know, maybe think about doing a podcast. <laughs> You know, I want to. I'm going to yeah. talk to you after the show. Because, yeah. Because, <laughs> I mean, yeah. why not talk about it? Tell these people stories. Yeah. No, we we want to for sure. It's 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 phenomenal. People need to hear it. They need to hear that they can change their life. They can ch- they can heal. They need to know that there's a, a, there's a community out there that believes the same things they do. And I, I've learned that sometimes when you're really sick, you have to borrow the belief system of someone else. Call, and you can call it, call out your BS. Yeah, there you go. There you there go. You know. <laughs> Why do we call it this? Because it's your belief system. It's like, get your mind out of the gutter. Yeah, it's keeping you sick. Yeah. yeah. I'm trying to think what Phil Valentine used to call it. Be, uh, oh man. I can't remember. I used to yeah. listen to him all the time when I was Yeah, it was, uh, man, man my, my brain is not working today. I've been going too long. Been up since five, 530. Yeah. <laughs> uh man not bravo sierra but it was something bovine scatology that's what he called it okay okay yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well terrific so you have uh your website did we, did we talk about that you plugged it yeah i plugged it um the alternative healthcare solutions is the health fair um where you're going to get lots of information on different people who like myself and and how we've healed things and reversed things and lots of lots of information very good yeah. Well, right on. Well, thank you for coming. Well, this is on your way back home mm-hmm. to uh, stop by and uh, be a guest here. And all the details about Jamie and her business are in the description. Please uh, seek it out. And uh, also, I guess we'll put that link in there. Or they yeah. should reach out to you and yeah. say they heard you. I'll give you a link. Okay. And then we'll know how many of your listeners joined. Oh, my it'll gosh. Be, it'll be fantastic. Put me to the test. <laughs> 
So there we go. And uh, of course, go to what's your problem podcast.com. Uh, again, 10,000 downloads this year on average is what we're shooting for. Hey, if we landed a thousand, terrific. It worked. Next year, we'll shoot for 50,000. Why not? Because we got to believe in it, right? That's right. We got to put it out there. Uh, check us out again, what's your problem podcast.com. Subscribe, like, share, rate, review, all the fun things. And of course, Jamie, a uh, wonderful conversation. Thank you for stopping by. Absolutely. Thank you for having me. Oh,